Those that think we should not have this, this right certainly are driven in that aspect from criminal events, mm -hmm. right? It's that rights and responsibilities. Like Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, you're constant clamoring for rights, rights, but so very little about responsibility. What do you think is an overlooked aspect of preparing for self-defense or protecting your family or others? I think that... Welcome back to the Defenders and Disciples podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mike Seeklander of Shooting Performance LLC and the American Warrior Society. Mike was also the co-host of the Outdoor Channel's leading firearms instructional show, The Best Defense. Previously, Mike was COO, Director of Training, and Senior Instructor at the U.S. Shooting Academy in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mike also served as the Branch Chief and Lead Instructor for the Firearms Division with the Federal Air Marshal Service and senior instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, AKA Fletzy. Mike is a combat veteran of Desert Storm and Desert Shield. He's a former police officer and he is a nationally ranked competitive shooter. And now I give you Mike Seeklander. Morning, Mike. How you doing, sir? I'm great, how are you? Outstanding. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me, man. Let's go ahead and get started on some of these icebreaker questions, and uh, then we'll roll into the interview. Um, you, you ready? I'm ready. All right. So the first one is, uh, what advice would you give your younger self? It's so funny. You asked uh, you asked that question. I'm like, I wonder if he's going to ask this question because you sent me <laughs> some of these questions in advance, and I get to pick. Man, I, you know, I think maybe my younger self, I would I would tell uh, tell myself to you know, to be a little bit more patient in certain aspects to, you know, to not maybe rush through things and always be so goal, goal focused and maybe be more pe people focused, mm -hmm. you know, take some time to connect some people and realize, uh, I think maybe in my older years, and I'm not that old, but, and most people that I talk to a little bit later on in life tend to find that the people connection is more important than the thing you did. And in the end, the, you know, the people connection is what gets you there anyways. So uh, I think I probably would have said, hey, slow down, take a little bit more time to connect, take a little bit more time to enjoy the ride itself, you know, along the way. You know, I'm I'm very goal centric. Typically, I get up and I'm motivated. I want to get some things done and accomplish some things and train or whatever else. But, uh, you know, in the end, whenever that is, I think that that how we enjoyed the process is probably more important than where we got in the end of the process itself. So Taylor, your audio is dead. I can't hear you at all now all of a sudden for some reason. Oh, sorry. There it is. I, yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what does your everyday carry consist of? So right now I'm actually carrying a Wilson combat frame and slide 365. So I've got the macro frame on and I've got one of the little mini RMRs, whatever that is, the RMRC or something on the top of the gun. Mm -hmm. So 365 with uh, Ambi uh, thumb safeties. I actually have a manual safety on my 365, which is kind of a rarity, and a lot of people ask about that. But uh, that's that's what I've been carrying. Now, in the past, I've always carried typically a 1911 style system, so a Wilson Combat Compact mm -hmm. 1911 variant or maybe an EDC variant in the Certainly the main purpose there is that, you know, I was competing more so with 1911s along the way. So for me to carry the same family of gun made a lot of sense to me. So, but right now mm -hmm. it's actually the 365 and I'm so far, I'm, I'm really enjoying that gun. So awesome. Yeah. I, I shot 1911s for a while and um, I just got used to that thumb safety. It's just such a nice, beyond the fact that it's a safety, it's just a nice ledge to place your thumb to help with your grip. And when I got a, uh, it was an MMP 2.0 and they had the option for that thumb safety. And it was basically the same style. And I actually got one with thumb safety because it was so comfortable to use. Yeah, man, I, I years ago, before I carried 1911s, I was actually carrying an MMP 9C. And I don't think Smith & Wesson offered a uh, thumb safety, but I, I have the 2.0 as well. And I love that thumb safety, that thing, the, the grip and the way it works and the you know, mm -hmm. manipulation or manipulability of it, if that's the mm -hmm. proper word, is fantastic. So if I if I were to carry that 2.0 again or any of the Smith & Wesson MEP variants, I would absolutely have the thumb safety. Yeah, yeah, I would say those types of safeties are probably the only kind that I would advocate for or recommend for people because it it's an ergonomic safety, right? It's not something additional you have to do. Like 
we used to have the M9s when I was in the Marines and yeah. those safeties, it's just so unintuitive. I mean, you know, obviously it's also a decocker, but like the safety itself is such a strange process that you, there's so many steps your thumb has to go through to defeat a level three holster. And then addition to that, defeat the safety, you know, it's like, becomes like a level four holster almost. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, like you said, it's, there's no ergonomics to it. So mm -mm. I, I remember, man, I, t I, t I worked with a bunch of uh, Rangers. I think it was the Rangers that were carrying the M9 for a while. And uh, man, they were, they were having all kinds of problems with these things. Now, of course they didn't, they didn't carry handguns into combat much anyways, but they're mm -hmm. like, Hey, when we did, we've had some guys that, you know, come out of the holster and have that dead trigger with the, you know, the Beretta M9 variant. Of course, that's the benefit of the, I guess it would be the, what of the 92 G model, the one where the, the decocker slash safety mm -hmm. automatically pops back up. So I guess technically it's not really a safety anymore in that case, but uh, man, you're right about that. But 1911 style safety and M and P did a great job or Smith and Wesson did a great job on that is, it's just very intuitive. It's it's doesn't take a lot of training to wipe it on and wipe it back off. It does mm -hmm. give your thumb a red a ledge to, to ride on. So I've always been very impressed with them as, as yeah. far as the safety manipulation. And I would say too, with uh, I mean, uh, you do appendix carry, don't you? I do. Yes. Yeah, I would say um, that would be. I I don't I do outside the waistband concealed, but outside the waistband, like with the Glock forty eight and like with polos and stuff, I can conceal that. But if I were going to do appendix, it would either be something with a manual safety or something with an external hammer that I could decock and, yes. then, and then index my thumb on that hammer as I'm reholstering to know whether or not the trigger's being manipulated. Yeah, man, 100%. Matter of fact, the the 365, there there is a variant with a manual ambi safety from the factory, but that manual ambi safety is very small and it's hard to hit. And, mm. I, and I, I, man, I am drawing a blank at the company, but there there's a company that just released an ambi safety for the 365s. Uh, and it's fantastic. It's it's just a great safety. It's a huge improvement over the stock safety, which which is really really hard to manipulate. Mm -hmm. It probably would have been a showstopper for me carrying that specific frame. Um, but the new one I have is it's fantastic. So that's cool. I'll have to put a put a link in the description when when we figure that out. Um, so what's let me ask you? What were three things you would have on you during a zombie apocalypse? <laughs> or some other sort of socioeconomic collapse, you know, into the world situation. Yeah. So the three things, I think the question there is do I, when, when, when we say on me, does that mean literally on me? Like I'm walking or three things I get to pick from. We'll just say, take it how you want. Yeah. So if it's just if three things in general. So even if it's like, you know, if you um, say like, you know, some sort of solar, Electric, electrical setup like that would be one of the things if, if that of, isn't yeah oh, so you could pick yeah. just three things that you would have on you or three things that you would have i guess i should say yeah three things i would have so i i think i i would think i would have um some sort of secure bunker kind of thing like I, I was actually in a house at this location at one point <clears> in time and this guy he was a billionaire and built this incredible place i won't say where it is or who it is because <laughs> i i don't know i don't have permission but but this thing was a fantastic house. It was just a beautiful house in, in itself, but it was made out of, you know, brick and stone. And it, it had a second story, it actually had an elevator, but they had basically this, this kind of tunnel shaft that went to where their food storage was and all these different things wow. that I, they had. So I think maybe since you're, you're allowing me just to pick things, number one, I would pick <laughs> something like that, 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 it, that has a level of security that would be second to none. Mm -hmm. And then of course, I think the second thing I would pick would be some sort of transportation, like, a, you know, like some sort of AMRAP or tank type of vehicle, something yeah. that I could, you know, I could move around. You could button down in and, and just kind of mow over zombies. I mean, zombie mm -hmm. apocalypse, man. So, yeah, you know, we're probably not going to be traveling on it, but if I could, I'd be I'd be mowing over. So whatever that would be, probably some sort of armored deal, because I, I guess we would have to worry about the zombies and, and the humans as well. So something mm -hmm. I can button up in. <laughs> and then third Oh, that's a great question, man. What would my third thing be? Um, I don't, man, what would my third thing be? That's a great, great, great question. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the third would be, um, you weren't specific. So my third thing would probably be some sort of support group, like for whatever, maybe, okay, here's, here, I know what, uh, so of course I'm a co-founder of the American Warrior Society. I would have, you know, 50 or so like-minded coin members, the, the better trained of our coin members, Highly yeah. motivated. So I would I would have a team 
There you um, go. <laughs> knuckle dragon killers <laughs> there to support me. So I know I'm outside of the box a little bit there. But no, I like are... it. I like you. You, you stretch the boundaries of that question. Yeah. I like it. There we go, man. <laughs> well, on that question, so one of these others is, um, yeah, name one person. So in that team, name one person you would want on your team during a, during the zombie apocalypse, present company and immediate family members excluded. Yeah, I, I would, uh, man, I, I would probably pick, I, I would have to pick my buddy, Rich Brown. He, you know, you know, Rich, he's well-trained. Um, but mo more importantly, because he's very cerebral, he's very smart in certain mm -hmm. aspects. You know, he has great leadership traits. Yep. You know, uh, he, you know, he, he has a lot of traits that are, are underestimated. I think, you know, I mean, cause I know, I know guys and, you know, retired Marines, guys in special ops, you know, three letter agencies, all these hardcore, highly skilled you know, unbelievable super warriors, but, but Rich has some things that I think that he could bring to that team as well as the fact that we're very like-minded. So we could probably say, okay, we're, we now work, work together in the zombie apocalypse. Of course we would have our transportation, our bunker taken care of. Um, <laughs> I, I think he'd be, he'd be a, a great asset to uh, surviving something like that. So I agree. We might have to fight over Rich. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> last one. Uh, what do you think is an overrated movie? Oh, an overrated movie, man. Um, it's a very eclectic list of questions here. <laughs> it really is. And I actually, I, the, I, I didn't do a good job of actually picking something. I read that question and I'm, I'm thinking, I, for whatever reason, my brain said, he'll, he won't ask that question. What would be an <laughs> overrated movie, an overrated movie, man? Um, you got me. I'm sorry. You got me at a blank there. I'm, I'm I'm thinking of a lot of movies, but I don't think any of them are overrated. You know, I think um, so. If if I were to pick one, I would probably pick something in the Marvel series. You know, some of the. It seems that after some of the original Marvel movies and some of these superhero movies, that all kind of made sense. You know, there was the the Superman, and then of course several variants mm -hmm. of Spider Man and and whatever else. Right. And then. Mm -hmm. It seemed like Hollywood was churning out these Marvel type movies at a cyclic pace. And I, I don't mm -hmm. know which one. I, I don't want to poo-poo on one in particular, but I think the last, I don't know, five or six or seven that they're the, the next character has got to be bigger and better and better, and they're right. oftentimes not. I think right. I would probably pick one of those Marvel superhero movies that are like, okay, this is yeah, this is not superhero ish anymore. It's getting mm -hmm. kind of boring. It uh, it I yeah, yeah. I can take it yeah. or leave it now. We're before they're like, hey, pretty exciting. Um, probably one of those. Which one, which one? I don't know which one I'd pick. Maybe we should ask the audience which one they think they would pick of the yeah. Marvel. Movies. Yeah, comment below if you if you have an, un, an, an overrated. I almost said underrated. An overrated movie. Overrated. I would have to say, um, and this was kind of on the topic that we're going to talk about today, but uh, like the John Wick movies. Mm. I. I like I've, I've watched them before and I'm like, I mean, yeah, some of this stuff's cool. And I'm impressed by Keanu Reeves, his weapon handling ability outside, you know, obviously on the, on the film, but then also on the range as well, but at Terran Tactical's range. But I mean, just, I, I feel like those types of movies, they give people just this wildly unrealistic view. Now, even people who think that, have, who acknowledge that it's unrealistic, I still feel like on some, some subconscious level, um, it just gives people this unrealistic expectation of what self-defense is going to be. Yeah. That's a great point though. But you, you approached it from a different angle than I did. Like you, your overrated was like, Hey, th this, these fights and shootings and self-defense related stuff is so far out there. Yeah. Although some of the stuff is kind of cool and kind of realistic, but most of mm -hmm. it is kind of very contrived. Yeah. You approached it differently than I did. So I, I, I do <laughs> like that. I, I mean, I like the first John Wick movie because we first get to meet the guy and, you know, he's retired and he just mm -hmm. lost his wife or whatever. And he has a cool dog and there's a storyline yeah. there. And then after the story that story was good. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I, yeah. I, I agree with that, man. Great. Yeah. That's a good choice. I, I would say a lot, a lot of things like that movies that are like those action movies. I've found myself kind of drifting away from because just the realism is it's so rare. And honestly, this is, I, I, I had um, a guest on uh, James Car Carrick, his company, they do like they, it's, worth it or woke but i was talking to him about this and saying how like those action type movies i've kind of drifted away from and honestly like i like movies like uh one of my favorite movies is the greatest showman <laughs> which, which yes. surprised a lot of people it's a phenomenal movie and a I great story yeah. yeah 
But yeah. those at least, you know, I'm, I'm suspending any, you know, from, because I have a degree in engineering and then law, law enforcement, military background, like those things, I, it's, sure, you have the same experience. It's like, you know what's realistic. And so whenever you see that thing that's like, no, this is off, you just ruin the movie for me. But in that movie, like, whatever, I don't, I don't have any background in any of that. <laughs> So I enjoy it so much yeah, more. It, I, yeah, it, it's it's a movie movie. It leaves it to your imagination. And I, I, mm -hmm. man, I totally agree with that. I think that's the one downside to being, you know, someone who is in the gun community and combatives and fighting all these things. As you watch some of these movies, it's like, this is just so stupid. You know, whether it's this teeny tiny skinny male actor <laughs> beating the crap out of these <laughs> ridiculously huge dudes or right. maybe the quintessential female actor, the actress mm -hmm. that's not, she's not going to be able to fight her way out of a paper bag and she right. somehow physically is manhandling these 230 pound dudes. So it's, yeah, you're right. Man. Yeah. Good point. Well, cool. You have, you've survived the icebreaker questions. The ice has been broken. There we go, man. Dude, <laughs> ice is gone, man. Next question I want, I'd, I'd like to really like your opinion on is, and this isn't an iceberg question. This is, this is a question that I think we could, we could go on for a long time about is what do you think in this kind of, I think there's hints of this in the previous question we just talked about, but what do you think is the biggest threat to our nation or, or threats, existential type threats? Man, I think that, uh, I think there are a combination of threats out there right now. Of course, uh, you just happened to catch me on uh, a nuclear Holocaust kick, right? So, you know, Annie Jacobson just wrote this book, Nuclear War. If you haven't read it, I think I heard Rich comment on it in our show, mm -hmm. and it's terrifying. Of, co of course, in the past probably two or three years, for whatever reason, I've read a couple different books, one, Command and Control, you know, and some different books that basically talk about how we manage the nuclear arsenal and mm -hmm. You know how our you know, the strategic air command was was in the position to protect America, if you call it protection, basically to destroy the entire world, and mm -hmm. we can talk about that as well. But if you read her new book, she really <clears throat> breaks down the initial attack from a rogue nation. Of course, it's, it's North Korea. You know, I'll tell too many details for those that haven't read it, and then breaks down all of the details of a nuclear holocaust and. Mm -hmm. The, the reason I, I don't know if it's the biggest threat we, we're going to face right now or we could potentially face, but the the ease that it can happen with a few small mistakes is beyond terrifying. You know, to have a, um, let's just say that to have a, a COVID type virus that breaks that again, and let's say the lethality is a much higher level, we're going to we're going to survive that. And that's plausible and to an extent believable mm -hmm. that it probably will happen. You know, to, you know, that the, maybe a, an electromagnetic storm is going to happen sometime in the future. We're certainly going to have hurricanes and snowstorms. Climate change is a, is a long term issue that we need to face and probably worry about. But but one rogue actor player, one mm -hmm. mechanical mistake, one guy that's too amped up and, and had too much vodka the night before that does one wrong thing could start the dominoes falling for a nuclear holocaust. And once the, yeah. the, the, if you read her book and in any previously written books, what one thing you understand or you'll learn is that once the, you know, once the first domino falls, all of the other ones will likely fall as well. Now, I really hope, pray to God, that there's some human aspect somewhere in there that intervenes at some point in time. I mean, to be honest with you, if you look at this history of those things, we should all be dead anyways right now, but we had a couple different humor, human factor elements mm -hmm. that prevented a nuclear Holocaust, you know, in the, in, the, I guess it was the seventies and eighties, two events specifically, and not to mention all of the issues that could have happened where we actually lost nukes during airplane crashes. And we could talk yeah. about that as well, but man, I think to me, that's the scariest thing. I don't know if it's the biggest potential Right now, uh, unfortunately, the way she talks about it in her book is it, there's a very high potential. And right now, if you look at how the world is, you mm -hmm. know, how Russia is acting and feeling their, you know, their failure in Ukraine, some of the things going on in Israel, some of the things that Iran is doing, uh, man, it's it's a really, really, really scary thing. And then, of course, down in probably the order would be a second COVID type event or situation. That's going. That's going to happen. I think before mm -hmm. you and I are long gone, that's going to happen. 
how bad it is, who knows? And then there's right. all the other little things that we could deal with as well. But I also want to put a stamp on, you know, AI and, and deep fakes and all the things we're seeing on the internet related front where we're, we're, we are, I think we're entering a place where nobody will know what to believe about anything. Like in the past 50 years, uh, one of the things I don't think we I don't think we realize this as humans, even older adult humans, is that most of what we see is a, a fake. A fake is not the right word, but it's contrived. It's, you know, if you're watching TV, well, I'm watching TV because there's a TV show. No, you're watching TV because an advertiser wants you to watch TV mm -hmm. and they want to advertise. Well, I'm listening to the radio because the, it plays my favorite music. No, we've been listening to the radio for the last 90 years because... Mm -hmm. Someone said, hey, on, on radio, we can run soap ads, right? Um, you know, so everything around us is to an extent, maybe not entirely fake, but it's an, an advertising message. We're constantly sold. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I mean, you're going to advertise your podcast. I'm going to advertise the American mm -hmm. Warrior Society and some of the things I sell. That's part of the deal. But but it, it just it's amazing how much we're surrounded by that's not real now. With AI and, and deep fakes and for, you know, a computer that's that's learning at the rate of who knows how fast, mm -hmm. what happens in five or six or seven years? I actually listened to a guy on Rogan recently. You might have heard the show. This guy's a technologist, and he, he kind of predicted the growth of technology or the speed that it would grow back in the 70s. And he was right. And now he says, hey, by 2029, right, five years from now, technology will have done all of these wild and crazy things that you and I probably can't imagine sitting here in theory five years before that comes true if, if he's right. So you're talking about Ray uh, Kurzweil? Yes, I believe so. I think I think it's how you say his last name. Yeah, no, I heard that I heard that one as well. And uh it's what's interesting too about the things that you mentioned is how so many of them converge together. And you know, you go back to the COVID thing and uh, this video is mm. flagged now. But you go back to the COVID thing, and if something happens in the future, now public trust has been broken because of COVID. So even if it is something that's, that's more legitimate in the future, mm -hmm. people are not going to trust the CDC. They're not going to trust, you know, the, the um, what's it called? Pu you know, public trust is at an all-time low, and that's not good, right? Like that, it's not good to be in a situation where our society, the people we're supposed to trust and who have our best interests, um, either we don't trust them because they don't, or we don't trust them because maybe there's it's confusion about, well, do they? And maybe it was just some people that felt that the means justify or that the ends justify the means. And so they figured that for them, it was a white lie, but to other people, it was not a white lie. So it's, we're in a really bad spot. And I don't really know how to come back from that without a lot of humility from the people who made mistakes um, and also a lot of putting tribal allegiances or, or not, not prioritizing tribal allegiances as much as we prioritize truth. And it's, it seems like we're getting in a worse and worse spot with that. And so I don't, I don't really know a solution and how, how we come back. And you talk about AI, it's like you got deep fakes where I think this next election, we're not going to know whether or not someone actually said something or didn't. Did you see the video? I think it was open AI. They are releasing, I think it's, it's not Gemini, that's Google's thing, but uh, it's a new video, uh, generative like video AI, where like now it does pictures, but then they're going to have one that does videos. And they had like a three minute video trailer for this thing. And you tell it like, oh, I want to have, you know, a, a drone shot over this Chinese, Japanese village. And like it shows you in it and it's all completely fake, but it looks like stock B-roll that you purchased from one of these, you know, you know, story blocks or something like that, one of these websites. And it's all fake. Like none of it's real. Or like yeah. someone on a train and you know the train's driving by. So it, Yeah, it's... I actually they were talking about that on Rogan as well recently. Uh and I don't remember what show it was. I, I tend to listen to small snippets mm -hmm. of shows, but uh but that's exactly how they described it. And I have not seen it yet, man. I just and imagine give it two years. I mean it's growing mm -hmm. and evolving and changing at a pace that's it's immeasurable, man. Like they, yeah. they talk about technology. It's a hockey stick. Now, you know, mm -hmm. we are on the straight up 
period of that. And, you know, that, that particular guest, for those that haven't listened to that show, you know, he was actually pretty, uh, he had a, a positive spin on things. He's like, you know, if technology increases, this mm-hmm. makes us smarter. Right. And in theory, this should make us safer. And then we're already currently safer than we were back in, let's say, 1942 or 22 or 1912. And and that crime has gone down. And, and maybe, I don't know, I guess it depends on how you look at those numbers. Maybe mm-hmm. so. But there's also, there's a, there's a problem. You know, yep. we have no public trust. And you said something about if the folks that made mistake have a little bit of humility and <laughs> that doesn't happen, man. Nope. That doesn't happen in our government. It doesn't happen in politics. And, you know. I remember 50 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever it was, you know, back in the day, you know, people made fun of lawyers and (laughs) politicians. And then we forgot about the politician side of the house. We forgot that politicians in, in a, in a large manner, in most cases, bend the truth. I would almost like to say lie for a living, but they bend the truth for votes. That's literally what they do Uh, Mm -hmm. and get it. I, I get it. We have, we've set up our system where, to be successful, to be, you know, to get a su- success metric there, you need to get voted in and then voted in again. A politician mm-hmm. that doesn't get voted in loses, you know. So right. we built a, a process, we built a system where they're incentivized to win. And winning is bending the truth and mm-hmm. selling themselves and, and doing things that I, I get it. I don't blame them. If I got into politics, I would have to do the same thing. But we've gotten away from leadership. The, mm-hmm. the focus is not on leadership. And I'm not saying there are not some politicians out there that have not been good leaders and that have not led the country and or tried to lead the country and had good, you know, good intentions in those areas. But boy, we have, we, it seems like we get farther and farther away from leadership the farther we go down that road, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They definitely seem to forget that they are public servants first. Yes, that's right. Public servant. Yeah. You serve us, man. We don't serve you. <laughs> Although we pay the tax bill, right? For what, are, <laughs> what for our, what is it? $33 trillion of debt now? Yeah. Or something yeah. like that. I honestly think, I, th- I think I've said this in a previous, I think I said this with, when I had Rich on, we were talking about taxes. And I said that I think that tax day should not only, I, okay, a few things here. You know, typically when people, they work for an employer, they have to set their deductions and everything and it automatically gets taken out. I think it should get taken out and the, the employer should have to hold on to that money and then have to give it to the employee to take to give to the or have them write a check or whatever. So that way you yeah. have to physically see it. And then it should yeah. also take place the day before Election Day or at least several days before Election Day. So it's like you pay your taxes and now go vote for someone. Dude, I'm telling you, man, it's it's interesting as a private business owner, probably much like you are, you actually see the tax check you write mm-hmm. at the end of every given year or period of time. You know, where a huge amount of the American population is like, hey, it's tax day. I get a refund on my taxes. No, you don't actually get a refund. You're paying taxes. I think that would solve a lot of problems. I think I think we're rich and I were talking about this the other day. I think some sort of mandatory service and the military, some sort of community or law enforcement, number one, would change perceptions Mm -hmm. and fix problems like almost instantaneously. And then I think that would be a second thing is like, here's your money. At the end of the year, go to the IRS, get in that line, yep. and you're going to pay your tax bill, what your tax bill is. And then you're going to question that government and all the money it hands out to whatever it hands it out to, whatever mm-hmm. it spends it on, right? I mean, it's yeah, completely amazing. I think the, the way it's like the deductions and the fact that they take it out was a brilliant – I don't know if it was intentional, but if it was, that was a brilliant strategy to not have people protest – how much money is actually be taken, being taken out of their check? Because no, it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, we were making fun of a recent meme. It was like uh, back when uh, the colonies revolted against taxation. It was what one or two percent tax on just a couple small small things. And now, mm-hmm. what are we at? 30, 40, 50 percent taxing. You know, yeah. depends on what state you live in too. You know, I have mm-hmm. people that order some products, for example, from California, and it's city tax, county tax. Northern County tax, state tax, the ballpark tax. It, it's, it's amazing, it's actually. Yeah. yeah every, and even just the, beyond just taxes, just the annual renewal fees and things. Like I yep. paid t- Tennessee, I think it's like 300 something dollars is like the annual renewal fee. And I, they haven't helped me with one single YouTube video or one single course. So I'm yes. still, I'm still waiting on it. I'm still waiting right. on it. But. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there'll be be there soon so yeah 
Well, speaking of uh, businesses and your business in particular, how did uh, shooting performance start? And in so you have shooting performance, and you also have American Warrior Show, American Warrior Society. Can you, can you talk about that and like the genesis of those? If you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to use deadly force to defend yourself or to defend someone else, then you're going to want a good legal team defending you after the fact. And that's why I trust attorneys on retainer. And if you want to see how AOR compares to those other CCW insurance providers, then scan this QR code or check out my affiliate link in the description. They have individual and family plans so that you will be legally protected should you ever need to protect your life or someone else's life. And don't forget to use promo code DAD to save $25 on your initial sign-up. Sure. Uh, so when I started the Shooting Performance LLC, I was actually working for a company called the U.S. Shooting Academy here in Tulsa. Uh, I left government service. I left the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center to move to Tulsa to run the U.S. Shooting Academy, which it says U.S. Shooting Academy but it has no governmental organization. That was just the name of the academy that a guy named Tom Fee started here. Now, while I was there, I decided to write my first book, which is Your Competition Handing and Training Program, mm -hmm. big, thick training manual. And of course decided, hey, I better open or start an LLC for you know tax purposes and protective purposes or whatever else. Yeah. And then shooting performance grew into a training organization where I, you know, hosted and you know did all my class tuition and mm -hmm. multiple books and stuff like that. So that's when it actually started. I didn't really use it very much. And then of course I built that into a business when I left the U.S. Shooting Academy and went full-time as an instructor and author and member of the best events and stuff like that. So Awesome. You and Rich's show, the, uh, the, the American Warriors show, how long has that been on? Oh man, that's a great question. So I started the American Warrior Society um, must have been 2008 or nine. I'm not certain what year it was. Uh, okay. So we started the American Warrior Society. And of course that was, you know, our, what we currently, it's what we call our membership vault. Initially it was a, a website where if you were a non-member, you could get on it and read free articles and check out some free stuff. And then if you were a member and actually logged in and opened up all of the video content, you know, defensive hanging and training program, mm -hmm. defensive rifle, all of the, the learning content that you're probably familiar with. And then probably a month or two in the American Warrior Society, I decided to start the American Warrior Show, of course, to put out a free podcast. This was back back before everybody and anybody did a podcast. You know, there mm -hmm. were still a lot of podcasts out there, but uh, it was an audio only podcast and just started having people on the show. You know, people that we had used as subject matter experts for, you know, the society content we had on the yeah. American Warrior Show. So. Um, so, and it's, uh, you know, it, it took off and thrived and, and did great, you know, for many years and we still have a show today. Well, so when I was, uh, see, I think it was around 2014, right, right when I got out of the Marines, I went to school for, to get my undergraduate, undergraduate degree in engineering. And one of the other, he was also a Marine veteran. He was in the engineering program with me. His name was Lucas. And he actually sent me one of you all shows. And so I started to listen to y'all shows around like, I think it was like 2015, maybe it's 2014. But um, as far as I know, it was one of the only shows, because again, that was that was around the time when podcasts, I mean, they were getting a little bit more traction around that time, but now now they're, it's all over the place. That's, that's the thing to do, clearly, here I am. Uh, but <laughs> the um, I just remember listening to y'all show and you had so much good information on there, like self-defense. And, it, and, it, and it, going back to the, misconceptions that people have about self-defense. The thing I like about mm -hmm. your y'all show is that you were dispelling a lot of those myths and talking about things that I'd never really heard about before. And um, yeah, so you said y'all started that in 2008. Is that what you said? I think I would have to okay. look back, man. I would yeah, actually have a... to go back to the first episodes. And I mean, it, it was not very long after we started and released and actually launched the American Warrior Society. Matter of fact, the podcast might have been literally right around the same couple of weeks or month. Wow. Because when we released the actual launch the business and opened the website for sales, um, we were pretty close to having a podcast then. But then what you know what we initially did was it was an audio only podcast, didn't do any video. Uh, it was not on Facebook Live. We didn't do any live shows back then. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I literally went through kind of the who's who of guests. You know, we you know we we've had a Almost anybody who's really, or most anybody who's very, very uh, well known in the self defense mm -hmm. or shooting community on the show multiple oh, yeah. times. 
top competitive shooters, defensive shooters, to, you know, tactical guys, to knife guys, to attorneys, fitness guys, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's pretty impressive, man. When you go back from to the original guest list. And then of course the new guest, you know, Rich has had all kinds of guests on in the last several years. It's been fantastic actually, you know, with his coffee with rich Friday live stream. So, well, even the training vault, the online training vault, that was ahead of its time for that time period. I mean, now it's, fairly common to have online training, be it, you know, armed self-defense or jujitsu or something like that. But back then, I mean, that was a very, uh, as a pretty novel concept. You know, it's funny when we look back and when we started and shot a lot of that content and we recently just kind of did a review of all of content and I go in there, you know, and I'll change some things up and move it around and try to figure out how to, how to organize the material. So it's very, very seamless and it's, yeah it's easier for people to get in and go, okay, I, I'm, I know where I am and I know where I should go instead of just getting in there and going, okay, well, it's like, you know, being stuck on a YouTube page where there are a million different videos, as you know, mm -hmm. from being a, a big YouTube guy, you know, and the whole thing about YouTube is just designed to kind of distract you and keep you there and, mm -hmm. and suck you to the next video that can put you in front of an advertiser, which is fine. You know, YouTube, I use YouTube all the time as a resource. But in our training vault, it, it's it's supposed to be advertisement free mm -hmm. and very methodical and logical in terms of hey, how should you approach what you should have? But anyways, the the short story is I was reviewing it recently and I got back in. I'm like, Rich, we need to figure out what we're doing next. And we 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 haven't done everything, but we've done close to everything. And then I, you know, it's really fantastic content. Not to toot our own harm, but I mean, no, it is. It is. There's there's not much more that we we can really think about putting in there because like, well, we we did that. We filmed that. You know, we could do add on videos or whatever else. We have some ideas, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff, great stuff to learn. So, and you're also a very, I um, mean, in the, in the firearms training community uh, and the uh, pr competitive shooting, you're also a very prolific write, uh, author. So, I mean, you've written. How, I mean, what like at least four or five books now that I do. I, I have, uh, I have four primary training focus books and that would mm -hmm. be a competition handgun, defensive handgun and defensive rifle. And then mm -hmm. I do have a very small uh, book I call low light fight. So it's a low light book. That's the smallest book I wrote. It's, it's actually in the edit process right now. I'm reviewing it because there are tons of things I'm changing in it. Mm -hmm. And then I have an instructor book called The Art, Art of Instruction. Mm -hmm. I'm in the edit process of, of that one right now. That one is actually kind of the hidden gem. It's one not a lot of people know about. It's one that for whatever reason, maybe I haven't marketed it well, but you know, for a firearms instructor or any kind of instructor, even mm -hmm. martial arts instructor, tactics instructor, it's a fantastic book. We're actually doing some really big edits in that one and going to re-release it. But the current version oh, wow. is, I just reread it on the airplane back here yesterday. And I'm like, you know, when, when you can look back and you, you see a product you built or a video you did and you say, wow, I did a good job on that thing. That I think that means a lot because typically I will be very self-critical and I'll say, mm -hmm. man, I don't, man, I could have done way better on that video <laughs> or the audio yeah. on that podcast could have been way better or whatever else. I reread the art of instruction on the plane home and uh, it's pretty fantastic. I, I actually thought about putting out, uh, you know, some marketing and maybe email in my list about the book itself, just because I think there are a lot of people that don't know about it. I had a, mm -hmm. a student in class recently and Taylor, this will tell you what a non-marketer I am or anti-marketer. Maybe I'm not very <laughs> good at any of that stuff. So I'm literally in a class where the students have to have gone to my website to sign up. And we're, we're talking about competition hanging. It's a competition hanging class. And there's a student who's like, someone said something like, yeah, Mike, you talk about that in your book. We were talking about trigger management. And I'm like, yeah, yeah we did. And another student raises his hand. He's like, you wrote a book? And I'm like, <laughs> And I was like, that tells me what a horrible marketer I am, right? Or, or you are so unobservant. How did you get on my website? How could you sign up for a class and not notice? You know, so I'll, I'll take the blame. It's my fault. Maybe with his, uh, with his marketing background, I'm sure Rich was very uh, disappointed. <laughs> well, interestingly enough, he's, he has certainly has a marketing background in certain aspects, but his background is stronger in sales. So he'll connect with the person, but as far as getting in front of them from a digital aspect or a website or technology, you know, if you don't know anything about Rich, he's an anti-technologist. Like if there were, if he had a, a, a series of buttons in front of him on a, iPad or a website, and he was not familiar with what those buttons did, and he had to pick one of them to save humanity. And, and let's say he had three buttons, he wouldn't pick a button. 
He <laughs> literally would refuse to do it, man. He, because if, if he picks the button, it may break something. I'm like, dude, just push the button, see what happens, man. So he's <laughs> he's anti technology. So well, so uh, yeah, the the book, the instructor book that you. Uh, that's actually next on my list. I'm currently reading uh, Dusty's book, uh, Building Shooters. And so when I finish that one, I'm going to roll into your uh, instructor book. The, you have a course that's built around that too, right? We did, yeah. We, we actually just just taught that course. It's called the FIDC Firearms Instructor Development mm -hmm. Course. Uh, I rarely ever teach it, honestly, because it's a week-long class. It's a huge chunk of time. But that book, uh, you know, when, I, when we originally did FIDC, I decided to turn the material into a book. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, the book itself helps promote the course. We get many, many more requests than that we actually do as far as the courses. We're, we're contemplating doing a digital version, something where I could have students all over the country and teach some of those versus, you know, via uh, like maybe Zoom interactive like coach class mm -hmm. sessions. And then some of them where the student would have an actual assignment to watch a video and then do a self video of whatever else. So we want to reach more people on that deal. And once we get the new edit out, um, it will be fantastic. And by the way, if you're if you're listening to this right now or watching me and you're like, well, maybe I should wait on the new edit. You know, that's going to be a period of time off. I'm not certain how long it is. The current version of Art of Instruction is uh, is fantastic. I mean, it's a really if you are an, uh, an instructor of any kind and you want to learn about the structure of instructing and all kinds of good range related farms instructor tips it's certainly a worthwhile read you know you can get it on you can get on hard copy or whatever else you want to get it so it's it's a it's a good resource yeah i'll link it below um yeah i'm looking at <clears throat> take i was talking to rich about uh, that course and he said you guys have one coming up the next few months i'm gonna see i'm gonna look into taking that because i it i heard a lot of good things about it but um on on that topic what do you think makes a good instructor and then instructor? Like if you want how, and kind of take that however you want with it. I mean, maybe good instructor be like, you know, the bare minimum or maybe just above the bare minimum. And then great instructor be like, that is like the gold standard. It's interesting to ask that question because one of the things we do in FIDC is in the first hour, I do a quick introduction to the program. You know, I talk about the art of instruction. I kind of get in front of the students and kind of introduce the, the week long program. Mm -hmm. And then the, the literally the very first thing we do with them is I uh, get a blank board up there and I said, OK, if we were going to build a great instructor and I use the word great, not good, mm -hmm. great instructor, what would that instructor have in terms of traits? And I have them throw these traits out there and then they, you know, we, we eventually come up with a list of traits and then I put my PowerPoint back on and I said, okay, here's the list that I came up with. And here, here, the, here are the traits they generally say. They say, number one, he or she is an excellent communicator. Mm -hmm. uh, when I mean excellent communicator, I'm not talking about someone that has learned to communicate effectively and they have just good charisma. I'm talking someone that has mastered communication, that has mastered body language that understands how to use their body language to affect people, that has mastered tone, that how to affect tone to communicate to people, mm -hmm. and certainly has a body of knowledge that is second to none. Like there, one of the things about instructors is that a good instructor would have would have some information. They'll have right. some knowledge and probably a good deal of, of knowledge. A great instructor will have as much knowledge as possible. So now they can they can compare and contrast different things. Mm -hmm. So I think if you were to ask a great instructor a question, that great instructor would be able to give you the pros and cons of different potential uh, techniques or answers. Mm -hmm. They won't just say, hey, here's a good technique. I learned it from my favorite instructor and it's the thing I repeat. That's a repeat, what I call a repeater. Mm -hmm. They repeat what they've learned over and over right. again. A great instructor will have, you know, taken what they know and then learn other things so they can compare and contrast. So number one, they will be a, just an incredible communicator. Uh, that includes having a body of knowledge. Number two, they'll, they'll be incredibly skilled. There's a lot of people out there that may say, well, a uh, great instructor, you know, should have good skills, but you don't always have to be better than most of your students. Uh, I, I disagree with that. I think that if you're in front of a group of students and you can't do things as good a, or better than most of your students, then you probably shouldn't be teaching the class, you know? And I'm not saying that people always have to be better than everybody in their class. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. But the only thing that separates uh, an instructor from being better than the people in his or her class is time and hard work. Mm 
-hmm. Now, if you're newer in your instructional career, you just got your NRA certification, USCCA certification, whatever, uh, I get it, right? You haven't had time to, to, to develop that level of skill and knowledge and you mm -hmm. haven't spent that time because you haven't had that time. But the only thing that stops you from utilizing that time is you. Like you decide, I'm going to be better and better and better whatever skill you're teaching, right? Um, and then the third thing probably would be to be a fantastic actor. Like you have to be a, is it the Oscars for acting or is that the, is that for singers? Oscars? No. I think yes. So. Oscars. Yeah, I think right? so. Yeah. Okay. I think so. You, Oscar winning actor. You have to be able to get up in front of a group and mm -hmm. act in a certain manner, right? To convey things to your students. It doesn't matter how you feel that day. Rich and I give that example all yep. the time where we get in front of the group and say, hey, how do you, you know, after maybe a 15 minute lecture, we're like, so how do you think I feel? When we're talking about being a good actor, they're like, well, you feel great. You're acting all energetic. You have good eye contact. You have good body language. And we're like, no, I feel like crap, man. I had some bad Mexican food last night. I slept like crap. I'm tired. I flew in at midnight last night. So the ability to act is important because that's part of your communication traits. And then all of the other things, I think the small things that would surround those core traits would be, you know, empathy, you know, and honesty and all these things. In, the, in my book, The Art of Instruction, we actually use the Marine Corps uh, leadership traits and principles. Mm -hmm. I had a guest author named Brad DeLauder. Brad was a legendary Marine, and he actually covered that in the book, but expanded on those things. And if you follow mm -hmm. those leadership traits and, and qualities, if you can do those things and then have an understanding of the structure of instructing, like literally how to introduce a block of instruction, how to right. teach a block of instruction, how to address a question, in a structured manner, because the structure actually matters. That's one thing yeah. most instructors don't realize. Then you would be a great instructor, in my opinion. That's good. Yeah, I like that you guys introduced those as well, because I think, yeah, there's a lot of carryover or applicability in other areas outside the Marine Corps with those leadership traits. And so, yeah, that's cool. So for a student, let's say a student is wanting to look for a good instructor or a great instructor, what advice would you give them before going to the course? And then obviously there's some things to look for while you're, while you're in the course. Uh, but are there any, maybe first, like, what would you look for? And then when you're in the course, or maybe are there any red flags that are like, okay, this, this is, I need to either complete, either walk up and leave, right? <laughs> we're doing like, all right, we're going to do force on yeah. force with live weapons and point guns at each other. Like that would be one. Um, or any other examples like that. If you're interested in new innovative training tools, then you have to check out Ace VR and make sure to use promo code Defenders to get one month free. I'll admit that when I first heard about this device, I thought it was probably a gimmick and there was no way it would feel realistic. But the moment I put on the headset and held the controller, it was obvious to me that we had stepped into a new era of firearms training. Not only does the virtual reality environment accurately represent the real world, but the pistol controller has the same weight and feel of a real gun. And the trigger feels just like an actual trigger. With Ace VR, you can play several different game modes from drills that work on the fundamentals of marksmanship to competitive stages and even more entertaining modes that work on situational awareness. You can also compete with friends and others in the Ace community. And don't forget to use promo code DEFENDERS to get one month free. Yeah. You know, it, interestingly enough, we just taught a course and this was to a group of federal agents. And one of the one of the feds asked, Mike, how do we vet instructors? You yeah. know, there's there is there's so much information out there. How do we vet and find good instructors or know who we should listen to and who we shouldn't listen to? And honestly, it's a very hard question for me to answer because. A, I don't want to be self-serving or appear self-serving and, and, and go, okay, let me talk about my competing instructors mm -hmm. that sell courses as well or sell products like books and stuff. They all suck. So you should buy my things, <laughs> right? That would be dishonest. And uh, so it's very hard. But I would tell you that as, as a student, the, 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 problem with, there's, the problem with being out there in the internet these days is you don't know what to believe. But mm -hmm. the advantage of being out there in the internet is you can research anybody and mm -hmm. everybody. It's very difficult for someone to hide their background. So if you're looking for a good instructor, certainly you should look for someone or take a class from someone that has some skills. You mm -hmm. could probably find their videos online. You can find their YouTube videos. They could find You could find them doing a drill in their course or whatever else. So number one, 
watch watch what they're doing. Can, if they're teaching combatives, can they fight? If they're teaching firearms, can they shoot? If they're teaching you a competitive handgun class, have they done? Have they been successful in competing? Mm -hmm. uh, if they're teaching defensive handgun, you know, have they, uh, you know, been in a position to teach in an academy or whatever else? So that would be number one. I think number two would would be to look at what they've actually done in terms of instructing. Like when I started instructing privately outside of the U.S. Shooting Academy, I had been in in the Marine Corps, in county law enforcement, in city law enforcement, in federal law enforcement, a federally certified instructor, a federally certified curriculum developer. And I ran the air marshal program uh, starting, give or take, in early 2002, got hired right after 9-11 uh, for the entirety of what they called phase one and phase two training, right? I was also a lead firearms instructor in the Philadelphia Field mm -hmm. Office. So in, ter in terms of my level of experience and, and background, I think it would be very hard to compare to those bullet points that I had maybe checked. So mm -hmm. does your instructor, maybe that you take a class from in Ohio, need to have the same background as Mike C. Klenner? No, but they should have some background. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they're a guy that's been in law enforcement for 10 years and they do a little competing on the side and and they finally took their, you know, their instructor certification at their department. So they, they should have several checks in the box. Now, there are some outliers out there. Gabe White. Some instructor. <laughs> What's that? Gabe White. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> They, they they are they are they don't really have any background necessarily. He's phenomenal. <laughs> they're fantastic communicators, yeah. and maybe he's one. There, there, I think there are several of those out there. Yeah. First of all, they're highly skilled. They they just took the thing, maybe a edge weapon defense, firearm shooting, long gun shooting, whatever else, and they just got into it, and they mm -hmm. they got really really good at it. And one of the things that students need to observe is it's it's very hard to fake skill. You can mm -hmm. fake certifications. You can fake body language and demeanor. You could be that charismatic, salesy kind of person that may be able to fake your student. You can't right. fake skill, mm -hmm. right? So when you watch someone perform what they're supposed to be teaching and they're really, really good at it and they're known amongst their peers as being really good at it, that's something to look at, you know? So they would be the outlier instructors that don't have maybe any good bona fides to, to follow. But man, you know, as a student, just do your research. Look up, mm -hmm. look up the instructor. And if nothing else, and the class is not that expensive, go go take the course. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll talk about the red flags here in a second. What's the worst case? You know, the instructor is not the greatest, but you learn one or two things mm -hmm. and you, you, you develop a relationship earlier on in this instructor's career. That's not necessarily a bad thing. If you learn one or two things, you're good. Now, red flags. Number one, safety. You know, you mentioned force on force with live ones. I have observed very briefly instructors deciding they're going to do, you know, disarms and different tactical related things with unloaded firearms, right? If it's unloaded. We all checked it's an unloaded firearm. Listen, if an instructor ever puts you in a position where they're pointing a live firearm at you or having someone point a live firearm, a firearm that can be fired mm -hmm. at you, that's a problem. That's problematic. Yep. If they have you doing things like laying on your back and violating safety rules, safety rules are there for a reason, right? The safety rules are in theory developed or were developed for real world use, not for just range training. So uh, if you have a, an instructor that's not, not following those safety rules, there's an issue. Those, mm -hmm. those might be red flags. Uh, an instructor that can't perform. So you take this instructor's class and he goes to shoot a gun and he a, never shoots a gun in front of you or never does the combatives technique in front of you. Or when he does it, he, he's bad at it. He's really not good at all. And he may say, well, yeah, I'm the instructor. I'm not here to try to beat all of you. And OK, stop making excuses. Mm -hmm. I think those of all would all be red flags. If it's a safety related issue, leave. Don't put yourself at risk. Get out of the class. Leave. Walk out of the class. You just make sure you're knowledgeable enough as a student to know what an actual safety related issue is because some students don't know what that means either. They don't realize mm -hmm. it's like, you know, sometimes there are some issues that we have in, in instructor class. We have to break down those safety related issues. Yeah. Um, now, if, if the guy's just not a good instructor, I, I may say hang out because may, maybe he will relay one thing that he knows that he learned from someone else that might be useful. And it was mm -hmm. worth your 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or 200 bucks, you know? Yeah. Well, and then also, even if, they don't real, realize something that you benefit from. 
even just learning what not to do. Maybe if you're someone who wants to be an instructor mm. and you see this person and you're like, oh, okay, that's what, that's how that comes across as to a that's student, right. you know? So cause sometimes it's hard to know, like when you say certain things as an instructor or a teacher, how it comes across to the students. So when you're in that position, you're like, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. And maybe you're doing Never. it and you see someone do it and you're like, yeah. oh, I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that, man. Especially if you're a future instructor, you have a goal of taking a lot of classes and training and maybe eventually teaching, even if you're just taking the material back to your family and friends, mm -hmm. you know, you're taking classes so you can then go back and relay information. You get to learn something about how to relay that information, which is fantastic. So, yeah, well, and, you know, something you, you talked about, you know, an instructor's experience in the, like the, uh, the public sector and, can you talk a little bit about the difference between public sector instructors and private sector instructors and kind of the pros and cons of each and both of those spaces? Because obviously, and just to prime this a little bit further, the public sector instructors, they have a captured audience. It's not paying for the course. They're told to be there. A lot of times against their, uh, they, they'd rather be doing something else. Whereas in the private sector, you have paying students and uh, your success a lot of times is, or not a lot of times, mainly driven by the invisible free hand of the free market. And so can you talk about the differences between those two and the pros and cons? Certainly. So I think the biggest difference between, you know, the public instructor, you know, for an agency, you know, federal law enforcement agency or any kind of entity or agency, I and mean, it really doesn't matter, any corporation that, you know, someone that's, that's listening to this that works in a corporation where they have to do a regular instructional class on X, Y, or Z. You know, like you said, they have a, you know, a captive or a captured audience, right? Mm -hmm. Their audience can't leave. They're required to take the course. Those instructors are going to have to really, really master their material. They're going to have to, if they can, step outside of the box and make the material as fun and or as interesting as possible. Mm -hmm. I actually had to teach a class like that at Fletzy Charleston at one point in time. Uh, and the class, um, I don't remember the name of the class, but but the class was to a group of just hardcore warrior knuckle draggers. I won't say what agency they were with. So these guys are just warriors, just the ultimate warriors. Well, mm -hmm. maybe not ultimate warriors. Big, you know, that's the best way to describe them. And this class that I was required to give was a Fletzy required class, and it was administrative in nature. And it was it was counter to the mission this particular agency held. So the, oh, the class they were required to get by their agency through Fletzy countered some of their rules of engagement. Man, so I, I had to find a way to communicate who I was and my beliefs as an instructor. I had to find a way to communicate the material so they understood why they were required to take that class and what the testing procedures were or whatever mm -hmm. else. And that's the thing about a captured audience is you really have to be a really good communicator to convey things to your students because they may not want to be there. Even if it's a cool class that we may love, like a shooting class or tactics or combatives, you know, they, mm -hmm. there's one or two students that don't want to be there. We just, just taught a class and one of the students asked, hey, how do I motivate those students that don't want to be there? Now, of course, you can contrast that with, the Mike C. Clanner that's out there teaching a private group and every one of those students that paid good money to be there, or maybe they are uh, an entity from law enforcement or the, the military, but they're at the tip of the spear. Like they're elite level individuals that always want to learn something. They mm -hmm. always care about training because they know that that will probably make them safe at night. They'll, they'll go home and uh, they, they completely differ. But I tell you, I think the bigger challenge is probably working for an organization and not necessarily being a private instructor where people are going to sign up and pay for your class. It's going to be motivating people that don't really want to be there. Mm -hmm. And you've got to have perfect communication. You've got to have good, you know, a good understanding and use of the material. And at the same time, try to figure out how to make it fun. Try to, try to figure out how to make it to an extent enjoyable as much as possible uh, in your class that you're teaching. So that's good. I like that. Yeah. Um, I've had some really great public sector instructors and then some that are just like, dude, you got this job because you knew someone and I don't even know why you are here. I mean, it's, and not, I mean, there may have been good shooters too, but like just some of the, there's also, I've noticed in 
maybe it's just law enforcement, but I've noticed a trend with some instructors where it's, I call it coaching or, or instructing for the sake of instructing. You know, it's like the students meeting whatever standard they want, be it time, you know, safety, accuracy, and speed. They're meeting those three things, but yet for no other reason other than just to just to instruct it's like hey maybe you should maybe you should try this maybe you should do this mm. and it's it's always been very bizarre to me and not not being a i'm, I'm more like results driven like are you do, are you meeting the results now obviously there's always tweaks and things that can make someone perform better but yeah um yeah I, i've just kind of i despise that type of instructing mentality and I'm, I'm curious now have you ever had an and obviously you don't have to say the name or anything but have you ever had an experience with you were in a class where you had some instructor do something that you were just like, what are we doing this for? Or why, why would you say that? Or it just a horrible experience? Certainly I have had probably multiple times, you know, we label that, we label it over teaching or over coaching, mm. right? So over teaching tends to be, you know, in more of a classroom setting or the instructional setting where we're, we're, we're giving details, additional details that are not necessary, right? Mm -hmm. We're teaching too much. We're just teaching just to say something. And that that's one of the things that a, a great instructor would also have to have is the ability to reflect in, in, upon themselves and say, you know, I'm going to minimize exactly what I say to the students, right? We, we always say less is more, mm -hmm. you know, use less words, use less time, but utilize words effectively mm -hmm. and utilize your time effectively, you know, in terms of your block of instruction. You know, the, the, the goal is not for you to look in the mirror and think you look good. The, the ultimate measurable goal of a great instructor is what their students actually learn, you know, and then later on what the students can actually do if it's a hard skills class and they're trying to actually teach a skill. Then over coaching is, and I have, I've actually had this happen a lot with my adjunct instructors, people that have worked with me, where that adjunct instructor, as I'm running the line, will see a student do four or five things wrong. And they want to capture and correct all five, five things like right now. We're going to fix this, boss. He's doing this and this and this and this and this and this. And I'm like, whoa, slow down there, little Gipper. Just slow it down. Just go over there and give him one tip. Fix one thing. And mm -hmm. then go back a couple minutes later and give another tip. Give him another thing. And then a little bit later, give him another thing. You know, approach things one at a time. Don't overcoach. You know, mm -hmm. overteaching is you know, over delivering on the block of instruction, using too many words, just, you're just getting too verbal, you know, stop. They're, they're not going to retain that. You know, you could, you could have an hour long speech and it's rehearsed and practiced to the point where you were literally perfect. Your pitch is perfect. Your wording is perfect, everything else. And then your student remembers about 10 minutes of that hour, mm -hmm. right? So if you're doing too much, then you're over teaching. And if you're working too much, on the line and trying to correct two or three or four or five things in a technique, you're probably over coaching. Slow it down, take one thing at a time, you know, and actually affect change in your students. Yeah, it's very congruent with Dusty's book, Building Shooters, where he talks about short term memory and then long term memory. And you have like long term, you have procedural and um, can't remember the other name, but uh, basically, like, you know, how it gets stored in short, short term before it gets written in long term. And how you can on it actually interfere with that process if you th either throw too many things at them at once, or yep. or give them two things that are too close together. Like you maybe show them two different ways to grip the gun, and it's like you're now those two things are interfering with each other before they get stored in long term. So yeah, I'm learning a lot from that book and how you know to make to relay the information and structure a class in a more efficient way for the helps people learn more effectively. Certainly, yeah. So okay. Something I've noticed is people, I would say the general public who goes and gets their CCW permit for, you know, even for the small minority of people who do that, very few of them go beyond that, right? Very few of them go beyond that CCW course and go to, you know, NRA basics of pistol shooting or basics mm -hmm. of rifle shooting or anything like that. Um, even those like bare minimum type courses. Um, can you speak to maybe how to, motivate you know for the for the for the people listening you know either motivate them or for an instructor how to motivate students to go beyond that and to get additional training because with police they get mandatory 40 hours of training now granted we we both know that that's not firearms training that's all this other administrative you know now nowadays it's like dei type stuff as well but mm. um so they have to do that every single year and i've and i've always viewed 
citizens who, if you're going to carry a gun, if you're going to get a permit, you, you've at least on some level acknowledged the possibility that you may have to use that. And there are certain things that I believe should go along with that. Otherwise, you probably don't take it seriously or, or there could be some ignorance there. You know, one of those being medical training, right? If you don't get medical mm -hmm. training, you know how to put holes in someone, but not how to stop holes in you or someone else, or maybe even that person you just put holes in. It, it, it tells me that maybe you don't think you're going to have to actually do it and you're just carrying around a, you know, a, a lucky rabbit's foot. So can you talk about that? And like what, I know that was a low, this is a big question, but like what, how to motivate students to go, to go forward and get more training and what type of courses someone should, should look to get next and then kind of to build that, uh, their portfolio of training. These devices reset your trigger after each shot so that you can dry fire just like you live fire in semi-auto. Plus, the Blackbeard fires a laser out of the bore so that you can track your shots and work on height over bore offset for close engagements. And the Blackbeard X uses an accelerometer to track and analyze the motion of your gun on their Mantis X app. Even the United States Marine Corps saw the training value in the Blackbeard X and began to utilize these devices in basic training. So now Marine Corps marksmanship coaches can analyze recruit shooting performance using the Blackbeard in order to make them better shooters. So stop wasting time with traditional dry fire. Order yourself a Blackbeard or Blackbeard X today and start training to a higher standard. So that's actually a question I have been exploring for literally... 15 years, probably, you know, maybe, maybe longer. And I'll, I'll tell you, so coming full circle, having been in the industry this long and teaching this long, uh, here's some interesting observations. I'll give you an example. When I was a, an air marshal instructor in the first, uh, maybe year or so, when a student would graduate from FLETC and then they would come to FAM training, uh, so FLETSI, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, they went to the basic course there. Then they would come to FAM training in New Jersey. And that's basically what we would call the advanced. They went to advanced tactics, the advanced mm -hmm. shooting courses or whatever else. So they had to pass back in the day a course called the TPC in the academy, in the basic academy. And the TPC was probably the fastest and hardest course ever in any law enforcement agency that's ever existed. The great thing was it was a fantastic course and it, it, to pass the TPC, you had to be a legitimate shooter, right? Of course, you know, two years later, uh, a certain federal agency took over air marshal training and they did away with the TPC because it was too hard, right? So that, it's so funny how those things happen. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's too hard. So we need to do away with it, right? Well, and the reality was back in the day with uh, FAMS, when you fired, shot the TPC, Depending on your score, you actually were eligible for a promotion to the next pay band. So it wasn't just score good to pass, but you score good, it affected your income, right? Mm -hmm. So I think little motivators like that might be a way for us to say, hey, how do we motivate people that are really not motivated? So how do we mm -hmm. translate that to the civilian sector of concealed carry holders? Mm -hmm. uh, and here's the reality. You can't directly do it. I have not found a way to directly do right. it. We can get on your podcast. We can get on my podcast. We've been doing this for 15, 20 years now, whatever it is, and say, you might be a gunfight tomorrow. You're going to be, I wrote an article called, uh, you're going to be in a gunfight tomorrow or something like that. It's a very compelling article. And I was pissed off because I'd actually watched videos of people doing things online and saw some students in a class I took. And they were just so underskilled. It was embarrassing. It's mm. just embarrassing how these gun carriers were underskilled. Um, and if you look at the average concealed carry CCW class, if you still have to take one in a state, the shooters in those classes are unbelievably underskilled. That's the mm -hmm. best way for me to put it, you know? So yep. I'm like, well, how do we motivate people? Well, we can get on a podcast, we can get on a video, we can rant, we can rave, or we could do all these things. In my experience, that will have almost zero effect, mm -hmm. okay? So we need to approach it from the other angle. We need to entice them based on gamification, right? So I think here, here's, here are the steps that I've taken. Number one, if I can hook people into competing, so I can get them to go to a local still challenge match with mm -hmm. 22, if I can get them to maybe try an IDPA match, USPSA tends to be a little bit more complex, but if I can hook them in, in competing, their skill level, because now that becomes their hobby, mm -hmm. will dramatically 
improve. Like yeah. if you look at the average competitive shooter with average skill, midline shooter, C or B class in USPSA, you know, um, I guess sharpshooter and IDPA or maybe expert, they have a dramatically higher skill level than the average concealed carry holder out there. So if we can hook them into competing in one form or another, that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Another way to do it is all these fun little uh, measurement things. Like everybody has a coin challenge. Everybody has a, you know, you, you want to get the triple nickel. You want to get the something eight. There's a, there, there, there are all these different little challenges out there that motivate shoot because, because people love gamified stuff. You know, it's, it's how we've evolved since, you know, the eighties when we all had video games and we wanted to get that next little score or whatever. Right. Else. So if you can gamify it and you can have little shooting challenges and then you publish those shooting challenges and Hey man, you want to make the master list for the C cleaner course. Or you want to get the triple nickel or you want to get the whatever else. There's something about that that motivates humans. It gives mm -hmm. them this goal mentality where this average, maybe concealed care holder, maybe, may, and, and you could start simple. You know, I, I used to have a series of tests called the Grandmaster Challenge. And the first part of Grandmaster Challenge was a bullseye test. It was a slow fire bullseye test, but it was pretty hard. And then if you pass that level, you get to go on to the next level, which is like a play rack. And the next level is a one second draw process. And there are all these things and all of these challenges taught someone. I actually used it for my air marshal instructor cadre. But the bottom line is if we can hook them in competing in some way, shape or form, or we can gamify the process. So if you were an instructor, listen to this and you're like, I teach locally. I want to do, I do a lot of concealed carry classes. I really want to get my people into the next class. Here's what you might do. Every concealed carry course you teach, you finish your course, you graduate. They have shot their little qualifications, whatever it is. It's probably meaningless. It's literally almost unbelievably low skilled. Then give them a little challenge course. All right. Can you hit five plates in five seconds? Can you shoot five so shots in the black? Oh, you did, man. You made the marksman category, whatever it is. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, that was fun. I want to do that again. Okay, you can. Come back next Saturday. We're doing this little challenge thing, whatever. I mean, you, you can build it however you want to yeah. build it. But if you get people hooked into that kind of gamified system, man, I'm telling you, it's just weird how they grow. Because you look at competitive shooters and the skill level they possess compared to the average concealed care holder, there's no comparison, Taylor. Like, they're not even mm -hmm. on the same chart. Right. Right. Um, uh, and that would be, I think, that's the only thing that I found that actually works. The only thing else that would work that hasn't happened is if literally zombies started <laughs> popping up. And then let's just say that the training community would evolve over the next several years of zombie fighting yeah. where we realize we actually have to be good with our guns. Yeah. And then people will be very good. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I really like that. Uh, the gamifying aspect. And uh, on that question, talking about like competitive shooting and when someone, you know, cause I've done that with like people that I know that carry that, I think need to get more training maybe. And I think, you know, competitive shooting is a good way to one gamify it, but then also I think it has a, an, a, a way of showing someone where their, uh, their inadequacies with regards to mm. their ability to manipulate a firearm. Um, now, would you say I, recently though, I've been thinking about whether or not that's effective to, again, reading Dusty's book. And he, he talks about how stress can be good, but sometimes stress, especially like in a force on force scenario, if someone's not prepared, doesn't have the, the weapons manipulation skills, you put them in the scenario and that can actually cause, uh, it, can, it can be detrimental to their ability and, and, and actually hurt them in the long run. Do you think that's true with competitive shooting too? Where if someone, obviously if someone doesn't know anything, right, they don't even know how to load the gun, you put them in, you know, mm -hmm. Load and make ready. They're going to be like, what? <laughs> but, you know, yeah. is there a, a certain maybe baseline? And this might be hard to quantify, but a certain baseline that you would say before someone could get into an IDPA match or a running gun match or something like that? So th there, there probably is a baseline. Uh, you know, I I would suspect if someone maybe literally they they decided, hey, I'm actually going to own a firearm. And they go to the store and they buy their first handgun, right? And then they say, well, I, I've heard someone said there's this thing called an IDP match at this local club. I'm going to go there and, and sign up for it. Uh, that, that may be too soon, mm -hmm. but I would tell you that same shooter, 
that they could very that they should they should certainly go watch that match number one, mm-hmm. and I would guarantee if they talk to the people at the match if they if they have any semblance of the clubs like that I've been around and say hey I'm I'm really new to this I've never shot I'm not even certain I can do this I just want to watch I guarantee you that individual will probably have one of the competitors pull them aside and explain things to them and maybe even offer to let them shoot a portion of a stage mm-hmm. or maybe to work with them on the side, right? And then wherever they are on that range, they could probably find a local instructor. And that individual, you know, invest in a two or four hour private. Say, all I want you to do is to get me ready mm-hmm. to go compete in a match. And then maybe, and I hate I hate to say it like this. Maybe they go practice for a little while, maybe for a couple of weekends, do three three or four privates. And I would be very limited in how much they should do that. Because generally speaking, what I tell students is don't go practice a bunch before you go to your first match or before you go to your first class. Because then, you know, you're just you may be ingraining mistakes and bad habits, right? Instead, jump jump into it. I'm not literally saying that for that student that just literally bought mm-hmm. the gun off the gun shelf. But once they've had any fundamental level of training where they can they can safely load and unload, you know, they understand the fundamentals of marksmanship, uh, they can probably successfully go compete in a match and, and be okay. And then, you know, if it's a non-moving match, like maybe you have the ability to shoot a rimfire challenge match somewhere or a rimfire steel challenge or whatever else that's not really applicable to kind of defensive context it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. it gets them into shooting and 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 hopefully hooks them into that becoming their hobby right so instead of spending as a defensive shooter all of their money on golf now they're spending all Mm -hmm. of their money on competing and learning to compete and shoot better which is going to translate directly into their defensive carry applications and stuff like that so i'd say that yes it might be possible for a shooter to be too brand new, but I'd say that's very rare. I say mm-hmm. more often than not, someone that has some basic fundamental level of skill could go to a match and be perfectly okay in that match as long as they have the right mentality to take their time and learn, you know, and not go in egotistical or whatever. Right. So, yeah, I like the last part you said there about, you know, going there to learn and not going there with a big ego because one thing I'd recommend to people. If it's their first match, regardless of what their school level is, if it's their first match, I always tell them just compete against yourself. And and when I say that, don't like try to, you know, burn down the range. Like, don't worry about anyone else. Don't worry about the timer. Worry about one safety. Make sure you're doing it safety. You don't uh, violate the 180 rule or anything like that. But then also just compete against yourself because I think that alone, you know, just breaking that barrier of getting in front of a bunch of people and having to draw your gun after a buzzer and then having to go through a stage of fire while people are watching you, even if you just go slow, I think that that amount of stress inoculation is far more than most people uh, will ever experience prior to being engaged in a real stressful event. And so um, now obviously after that, you know, do that a few times and now you can start, you know, after you get home, getting, you know, checking your email for when they submitted the, um, or get on practice mm-hmm. score and check the practice score scores and stuff. But the first few times, don't even worry about the score. Just worry about safety and then completing the course of fire as it was prescribed. Yeah, because getting attached to the results and, and worrying about that kind of stuff is is foolish. And, then, you know, the, the people that go to a match and maybe they come from a background where they're highly competitive. They are, you know, they're, they're an attorney and, and they're, man, they're a, they're a go-getter attorney and they're used to going to the courtroom and winning and mm-hmm. – or maybe they're, I don't know, maybe they're a high level architect or maybe they're whatever. Maybe they own their all own small business and they run the show there. They're the boss. They're the tough guy, big guy or big gal. To, but to go to a match and expect much, much else is kind of foolish. Mm-hmm. And it just it sets yourself up for failure. And I'll speak to the law enforcement and military folks that are listening to this right now or watching. If you decide to go to a match uh, and you think, oh, I'm really well trained. I'm in law enforcement. I'm a professional, a professional at arms. And you go to your first match and you've never experienced that environment, you can expect to get just whacked. Mm-hmm. They're going to just crush you. Right. Don't don't let that don't you get check your ego at the at the door. Right. Leave leave that alone. And you're going to be a lot more successful later on if you simply learn from these individuals at the match that are beating you. Now, maybe you're a really good shooter as a police officer or whatever else. Well, you'll probably do fine. 
You may win the match, but for the rest of you, just check your ego at the door mm-hmm. for anybody that goes to their first match. And go, just go and have some fun. Right. Enjoy it. Get into it, you know, and uh, people will be so much better off for that. So, yeah. And also understand that it is a game ultimately, right? So, like, even, you know, even like um, jujitsu, right? Competitive jujitsu, like, it's not the same as street fighting, right? There's a game element to it. There's a, uh, there's a tactical strategic element to that, that works in that space because there's a different goal in those games than there are in a street fight, than there are in a gunfight in a self-defense context. So understanding that it is a game. And so even if you're never going to be the top shooter, well, if you're that police officer who's going with their full duty rig, their level, the level three retention holster, um, you're not going to be as fast as someone who's there with some like magnetic holster with like no, nothing to defeat. Right. Like maybe, maybe you could, uh, but more than likely if you're voluntarily putting those barriers on yourself, just accept that and acknowledge that like, Hey, it just is what it is. And sometimes they have like duty categories and things, but, um, yeah, I think that that's, you know, a lot of people, I think because that's there, they like to talk down on competitive shooting and, I, and I've never agreed with that. I think that it has its yeah. purpose. It's like you said, it gamifies learning how to manipulate a gun with safe safety, speed, and accuracy, um, and moving dynamically and all that type of stuff. So, like, it is what it is. Um, I think that throwing the baby out with the bathwater is just a, a horrible way to go about it because when you do that, it's like, okay, well, now what? Now how are we going to motivate people to get training? Like, we're just going to yeah. take them down to Chicago and drop them off for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, see what happens. Yeah. Roll out there and hey, let's let's hope for the best <laughs> on that deal. So, you know, and, and competing, you know, for someone that is higher level, someone in law enforcement, the military, or whatever else, you know, the the, the to learn how to process information quickly is a part of the equation. Mm-hmm. But you know, we're, you know, it's just a, just an environment to test your your higher speed manipulation and you know marksmanship skills under the stress of a timer. You know, and I you know I know top level you know, elite gunfighters that the timer goes off and they feel a lot of stress and, you know, guess what? So if we can do that in the competitive environment and, and the sky is the limit, literally, you know, you could go from a no drawing 22 rimfire still challenge match where you're just learning to hit targets quickly and aim quickly and do these things. And then eventually progress to the point where you're wearing your actual carry gear mm-hmm in a full IDPA match, you can compete from the appendix position. So that would be the end all, or maybe your full duty gear, like you referred to. There's just a lot to learn from it. Uh, Certainly it is not training, you know, it's not defensive or tactical training. Don't look at it as training. Mm -hmm. Look at it as a place to test your high speed marksmanship and manipulation skills under a little bit of stress and then take away, Hey, this is what I need to go work on. And more importantly, if you, once again, if we suck you in, and you get into it and you're like, oh, I love this, man. I love that rush. I want to do more of that. You're going to shoot more. You're going to practice more. You're going to be able to apply that skill directly to your, you know, your defensive gear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that. What do you think is an overlooked aspect of self-defense either relating to firearms, general self-defense, prepare, you know, that preparing for self-defense or protecting your family or others? I think that, uh, and funny, Rich and I just had this conversation the other day because we're talking about how good is good enough with a handgun and how do you balance that with mm. oh, the, the other skills you should have. But I think I think an overlooked aspect of self-defense is probably uh, probably the, the the awareness piece. Mm. Honestly, you know, they're they're the hard skills. They're like, how do you deal with someone in close range combatives? You know, it's surprising how many people don't have good combative skills mm-hmm. there. Uh, you know, if, we're, if we were to fine tune that into the firearms arena, it's amazing how many people wouldn't know what to do with their carry gun in close range or contact with someone else. Yep. You know, these are all the hard skills areas, though. But, but if we're not talking about hard skills, I think I think the awareness and avoidance kind of piece is, is probably critical because there's so many people that are just highly distracted today in every mm-hmm. way, shape, or manner. You know, we're just so distracted by these electronic phone devices yep. and, and all these things. Having good awareness is not is not common. And the younger the person is in generations, you know, the, the, I hate to say it, the worse they are. Mm-hmm. They're just, 
they're really, really unaware of what's around them. And I think that's a big part of the equation is becoming very aware and observant of what's around you as much as possible so you can be reactive. And then from there, have some sort of hard skills or a plan, you know, after that. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit, situational awareness. Uh, Let's talk about what it is, how to implement it and how to use it every day. And then if you don't already have it, how to develop habits that help you have it, help, help you to have it. I think that, um, well, let's talk about what it is. First of all, situational awareness is just being aware of what is around Mm -hmm. you in any given situation. I'll give you a great example. I just taught this course. I talked about that several times in the show here. And I I found myself, Mike C. Claire tends to get kind of cerebral in terms of I'm thinking. When I do a lot of times, my head comes down as I'm thinking, I'm walking along and I'm contemplating what I need to change on my website, what I want to do for the next podcast what video content, what I just saw a student on. So I'm, I'm really deeply thinking about things, but I caught, I literally caught myself a bunch going, you know what? I am just not generally aware of who's in this hallway mm. in this motel with me right now. I am generally not aware of who is on the sidewalk as I'm walking to this, mm-hmm. this, this restaurant. And I'm like, this is just not an excuse. So I think that if we understand what it is, number one, it is, it's the ability to be aware. It's like, how would you act if I teleported you right now to, you know, somewhere in Africa mm-hmm. where you're no longer the largest predator around, mm-hmm. right? You're the smallest, you're yep. prey, you're literally prey. How, how, what would your head and eyes do? Well, your head and eyes would come up, your yep. ears would open, your senses would start to work. So, you know, think about things like that. Now, do we always have to be in that circumstance or situation? No, I probably don't need to be in this this room the same as I would be maybe out on my sidewalk in my subdivision. And then if I walk from my subdivision to this downtown area, it's, it's going to constantly change. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, you know, what, how would you act if you were dropped into the, into that continent right, right now? Right. The second thing we can do is we can make a decision to be situationally aware. And then we can systematize that. Like we can say, okay, I'm going to create some systems mm-hmm. and processes that will force me into, being more aware. Well, here, here are my systems and processes. If I leave a door, my front door, my car door, a business door, maybe Walmart, my phone will go in my pocket, mm-hmm. my hands will be free, and my head and eyes will go up, yep. right? So that might be an example of a process you could follow. And it just becomes your habit. If I exit a door, car door, house door, store mm-hmm. door, automatically my phone goes in my pocket, my head and eyes are up. I know I want to send another text to so-and-so. I know I want to look at whatever podcast I'm about to listen to, but I don't get to do that until I get into my vehicle, start the car and lock the door or get into my house and lock the door. Uh, and, you know, you could game you could game that out as well. Figure out what you want to do differently. What are your personal situational awareness weak points? And then come up with processes and habits and then commit to those habits. So let's just say we say, hey, this is my new habit called the door habit. Now I'm going to commit to that habit for the next 15 days. Mm -hmm. Every single day, every time I violate that habit, I'm going to penalize myself. Every time I do a good job of that during the day, I'm going to give myself a reward, whatever. And then literally it becomes an actual habit. So when you walk out that door, phone goes in your pocket, hands are free, head and eyes are up and looking around. Whether that means to communicate to people and connect more with the humans we're around or to be aware of the possibility of a threat. And I think that, that, that we just continue that with the process. That's good. No, I like that. I like the first of all, talking about systems. I'm a big fan of systems because it frees up your bandwidth to be able to think about other things. And then also the the habits, you know, what you said was basically like just that book, Atomic Habits, you know, just do yep. little things and then eventually, you know, don't, don't do a bunch of stuff at once. Just do a few things now and then and build on that. And that's right. I think, you know, we talked about earlier in the show, people's misconceptions about what either gunfighting is or what self-defense is because of Hollywood. And I think that has also been the case with situational awareness. They think that situational awareness is Jason Bourne memorizing every license plate in the parking lot or knowing all these different things. That's not, maybe, maybe you have (laughs) the ability to do that. Some, maybe some people do, but most people do not. Most people have a very limited amount of RAM, you know, random access memory that they can operate on and they have to utilize that and um, triage what to and not to pay attention to. 
and paying t- paying attention to all the license plates in a parking lot on your way. Like it's just not gonna, you're going to miss something else in the process of doing that. And um, I, I like what you said about yeah, putting your phone away when you go through those transitional spaces because that's more oh. likely when you're going to encounter something is that transitional space, right? You've you've basically just gone through a portal <laughs> and now you're in another area, another another universe. So process that universe. And then, you know, you can go about, go about your, make sure that there's no active shooting going on in this new universe you just went into. But I do think that some people have a misconception of like situational awareness and this, like this hyper Jason Bourne level um, ability to memorize every single detail about every single thing. And it's like, no, you're wasting your time there. Again, there are some people that can do that. Most people cannot. Um, And I don't know if you want to talk to talk about that at all. Man, you know, the interesting thing, so when I use the analogy of the, you know, tr- teleported to, to Africa someplace, you know, people in their mind, or maybe they'll listen to this, they're like, well, okay, yeah, you, you go to that place in Africa, you are now prey. There's there's something out there that is hunting you, and they can't maybe wrap their head around that, you know. Mm-hmm. But if you look at, look, look at crime, so number one, can we accept the fact that crime occurs? Yes, you can't not believe that, you, you know, to, you'd have to not watch the news. Right. and. And you have to be completely living with blinders on to not believe that. Well, guess what? If a criminal is preying on anyone, anywhere, they are hunting. Mm -hmm. You are the prey, potentially. You're probably not necessarily hunting. So it's really not that much different if you think about how that application is. And then, of course, you know, you can look at all of the different circumstances that true accidents happen and all the things that happen that people are just unaware of and get popped, whether it's in traffic Mm -hmm. or whatever else that, you know, the, we, we just have to follow processes to be aware of those things. And no, no human is, is good at them specifically now, because now we're, we're task saturated mm-hmm. with thinking about the groceries, dealing with this, dealing with that. And 90% of the time, you know, it's on some sort of a phone device or electronic device or whatever. We are highly, highly distracted. Right. And, you know, maybe there's some benefit of just, just head and eyes up and just looking around and, you know, enjoying the clouds as they float by and just, just being observant mm-hmm. in our in our environment. You know, you, you've got plenty of time to be on electronics. You're in that closed space, that safe space. Okay, do it all as much as you yep. want or need to. That's fine. There, there's no downside to it. But, you know, otherwise, you know, you, you are if there if you believe there's crime in your area, you are being potentially hunted. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between being stuck somewhere in Africa where some lion is trying right. to find you, you know, and there are definitely some pre attack indicators that I think that it requires some level of either training or heuristics to to notice. But I think for the most part, most people have the ability to have that gut reaction to know that something is off. And so and I, I've gone through the the phase of like, Oh, I need to pay attention to every single thing. I realized this is not impossible. Like I when I did like church security before, you know, like, you're looking at every single thing, every single person, da, 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 and it's, you get exhausting. First of all, like you cannot stay in that condition. It's almost like a condition orange, you know, yellowish orange for too long, and it, it's you just can't do it. And you're going to you're going to miss something. So what I've found to be more effective is, for example, if I walk into a coffee shop, you know, I phones away, I walk through that uh, transitional space, and the first thing I do is check. Not not like you know, real quick, like I'm doing CQB or something, yep. but I just quickly check the you know the room to make sure I know the layout, what's going on, and then as I'm there, I just kind of casually look around and I try to look at every single person, not stare at every single person, but just look at every single person. And I'm not really making a conscious effort to like, oh, what are they? Did it, let me see their body. I'm a, I'm trusting that my subconscious mind is going to pick something up. Now, could it miss something? Sure, but I, I've found that doing that and just kind of observing and if i like notice something like and it catches my attention then i'll go into maybe a second or third order analysis on what i'm seeing but just trusting that your subconscious mind is going to pick something up i think frees you up to one enjoy your day and to uh observe more things that you otherwise would not observed be uh, observed because you're spending too much bandwidth on focusing on this little old lady that is really not a threat yeah. and you miss the person over here in the corner that's, you know, uh, with their hood on and it's the middle of uh, June. 
Yeah, I love that, man. Eye contact to an extent or not eye contact, mm -hmm. at least looking at the people. But here's the thing. When, when you're doing that, I think you're trusting your unconscious to, to, to give you some cues. I we Most of us do have those things ingrained. You will notice something that will make your kind of spider sense pop up. But the second thing you do is you're sending an unconscious signal to anybody around you. you yep. know, someone that is potentially targeting or someone that is hunting, you know, that's that's a it's a proven deal. Like, hey, man, that guy with head and eyes up, he becomes less of a target because something about him is mm -hmm. aware. You know, I don't I don't think I typically present much of much of a target, big, bald headed <laughs> guy with a goatee. You know, so, you know, everybody has a different kind of aura mm -hmm. or energy or look or feel to them. But I think just by walking in yep. with that awareness presence or being in an environment with an awareness presence, someone that is potentially hunting hunting and looking for a victim may say, okay, it's not the time and place. This guy's, this guy looked right at me. And you yeah. might've been thinking about lunch and not even realize you looked right at him, mm -hmm. but you set off some cues and some signals as well. So, yeah, I'm curious if you've had this experience before. So, you know, it's, it's funny with talking about like looking around and things, police and criminals almost do the same thing when they look around, right? Because the criminals looking around to make sure no one sees what they're doing. The police officers looking around because they're having like situational awareness. The common place that this happens is like I'm doing like self checkout at Publix. Like I'm doing the self checkout, and all of a sudden I'm like look around. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, okay, people probably think I'm about to steal something because <laughs> I'm like looking yeah. around, and it's like I'm trying to see, you know. But obviously, I'm I'm just trying to while I'm waiting on this thing to process, I'm trying to see what else is going on around me. But I think it's funny because it, it, those do kind of look similar. If you see someone doing that, you're like, oh, what are they about to do? They're they're looking, you know, it's like the person who uh, looks around before they're going to make an inappropriate joke or something. They're kind of like looking, looking over their shoulder yeah. and stuff. So I'm, I'm just curious if you've had that experience or, or felt that before. Maybe not exactly like that. But I think when I pick up on someone that's picking up on me, oftentimes... And there's certainly some times in the past for me, it's been, it, it has been a criminal element. It's like, yeah, this guy gives me a look and I give him a look and, and he kind of reads my energy and I kind of read his energy mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether or not we're right or wrong, who knows? Cause we never actually spoke in real life, yeah. but the other people that I would pick up on are the, are the people that probably are in the same genre as me. You know, they're, they're probably looking for the same thing I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. I can almost guarantee they're probably in law enforcement or whatever else. So there's, there's that shared energy or, or thing, but who knows? There, there are some people that have probably caught me looking around or whatever <laughs> else, but it's hard to say. I think, you know, it's weird, man. It's kind of like when you're carrying a gun and you're super worried mm -hmm. about printing. Like I know a lot of people that are like, man, you know, you're, you're printing, man, the back of the butt of your gun is sticking out one quarter of an inch and man, you're really printing and whatever. Do you know how many people notice you printing in your day to day? Like zero, <laughs> like nobody. Like maybe that one police officer that was carrying in plain mm -hmm. clothes that is looking specifically for that. Mm -hmm. Or I hate to say it, man, a lot, a lot of times the guys in the street, you know, the thugs out there, they will absolutely notice that, man. They're used to looking for that, man. Right. The guy's going slack. He's got something mm -hmm. in his pants. But the point is that everybody else, they have absolutely mm -hmm. no clue. Like you could untuck your shirt, yep. probably tuck it behind the gun and expose it. And you could walk into any given store and you know, maybe your, your state allows open carry. But even though the people that notice that gun, like literally, what, one out of 10, mm -hmm. maybe? So, you know, it's weird, man. People, we, I think we think a lot more people see things that they see that they don't see. Yeah, I think so. And I, I like what you said about the, you know, when you do that, when you walk into a place and you have situational awareness, all of a sudden people see that and realize like, oh, that person's aware. They're not the target. They're not the easy target. And like when I, an example is um, when I'm buckling my kids in the car, our, our youngest, he's, he's still in like a, a, a car seat. And so many people I see when they buckle their kids in the car, they're like reached in because that's kind of how you have to do it. Right. And there, and it takes several seconds depending on the car seat. It can take anywhere from 10 to you know 20 seconds and how, how, how the kid's cooperating. But what I do is while I'm doing that, like I've done it so many times that I really, I could almost do it with my eyes closed because I know what I'm feeling for. So I'll like look while I'm doing it and I'm like looking over my shoulder in different directions. Yep. And I just, it's amazing, amazing. Well, yeah, I guess it shouldn't, but it amazes me how many people don't do that. And I think man, like that's, that's the whole, they came out of nowhere. Whenever someone's victimized, they always say they came out of nowhere because yeah. it's just like get teleported to the Sahara. The lion is not going to attack you from the front. He's going to come in around from behind. And that's why, I don't know if this is true or not, but they say like wear your sunglasses on the back of your head. They supposedly that yep. some predators won't attack you. 
but it's the same thing with humans and they will attack from the rear. Now, of course, there are yeah. situations where they may attack from the front, but if they do, at least now you know it's coming and they didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah, we used to make fun of that when we used to film The Best Defense. It was always my, my co-host, Michael Janich, always used to say, it's a, I was so surprised. They came out of nowhere. I mean, we used to make fun of people because you literally, if you read the reports or hear the people, they, they say the mm -hmm. exact same thing. They literally say that. Yep. I never saw him coming. He came out of nowhere. No, he, he didn't come out of nowhere. That's not possible. He came out of somewhere. He was walking up to you. You know, and I, I will say this, you know, you as we're speaking through this, you, the, people may say, well, that's Mike Seekliner. He's got really good situational awareness and, and, and skills. And I, all of us, I think all of us need to check ourselves on a regular basis. I just did it. I just like, man, and I, you know, here's what prompted it. I actually spent like one second scanning Instagram, which I rarely get on Instagram, but for whatever reason, uh, one of the videos was, um, Someone had, I don't remember who posted it. One of these guys that teaches this stuff, of course, are using it as their, as their deal. And it was, you know, uh, this, this, this tree, this guy ride, rides a bicycle by and the tree falls over right, you know, right behind him. Uh, this other one where this, this car comes speeding by and this person happened to notice and pull this other person out of the way. It was the, all these little situational words. I'm like, damn, man, I am, I'm getting stuck with my head and eyes down. I've been thinking about a lot of things lately. I'm like, come on, C. Clanner, check yourself, man. So I think all of us needs mm -hmm. to, need to check ourselves. We need to say, hey, I am not paying attention. So mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow a habit. Steal mine, use the door rule, whatever. Set your own habit. Whatever your habit is, set it. And then start executing on that habit, you know, this moment in time. Or at least doing the reps of your habit to build it or ingrain it better. And uh, make yourself safer. And then teach, you know, teach people you're around the same thing. Because I think we need to check ourselves on that one. No, I agree. And this isn't really self-defense related. Well, it is, I guess, if you think about statistically. But driving, whenever I go through an intersection, even if I have the green light, I slow down a little mm. bit and I'll look both ways because it's just, it's so easy just to drive through and not think, not think about. But you don't know if someone's obviously a drunk driver running a red light or a police pursuit yep. or a someone, you know, a fire truck going to an emergency call. I don't know about you, but our, the fire department in our city, like we used to have, very strict policies on like slow down, you know, check the intersection, clear the intersection and then go through it. They just burn through it. They never, Zip through. you get hit by a fire truck, like it's game over. I mean, there's just, that's so much energy, so much mass, but I'm um, you know, slowing down and checking that. Or even before you do a left turn, you know, before I do a left turn, I always check my left rear view mirror, even though I'm in the continuous left turn lane because police pass on the left. And there's been so many situations yep. where someone's turning left and then boom, right there, they get hit in the driver's side door. And, uh, but I still will notice myself sometimes I'll go through an intersection and I'll think, oh God, I didn't even clear that. And so, yeah, I completely agree. Like you have to be open and honest with yourself and critical enough with yourself to realize like, okay, you're, you know, you're dragging a little bit today. You need to kind of step it up and, and pay attention because that could have, that could have been the one that could have been the time where you drive. Through. It could be, that's right. That, that's the thing that that's the one time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a percentage. Can, can any of us be perfectly a hundred percent aware at all times? No, it just, it's just not going to happen. But, but maybe maybe we can increase our awareness by 1%. And that one intersection we decided to check. And I, it's funny, you say that I do the same thing. And I taught my kids. And I, and I don't mm -hmm. do it every time, but I, I really attempt to. Because mm -hmm. that, you know, that driver's side impact on a T-bone, you know, a car that maybe you don't hear. I'm like, well, wouldn't I hear the police siren? No, no nope. police siren's back there. This is the guy running from the police yep. at 120 miles an hour that's jacked up on crack cocaine mm -hmm. or whatever. And... Um, Super important, man. We can't be perfect at it, but what we could do is we could check ourselves on a regular basis. So yeah, what's a uh, we talked about an overlooked aspect of self defense. What do you think is a common myth of self defense? And you can talk about the fighting aspect, maybe the legal aspect. There's <laughs> now that I start to add to different aspects, there's several answers and several myths. But how how do you want to you want to talk about that at all? So I I I think that um, maybe it's not a myth, but I think that. So I, I, I'm going to speak to the, I'm not going to speak to your audience because I think your audience listening probably or watching is, they tend, they tend to be like my audience. They mm -hmm. tend to be people that are vetted and trained. I think at least put some effort mm -hmm. into it. I think, I think people are fooling themselves. So maybe that's a myth that believe they're going to somehow successfully defend themselves with their handgun with a very, very, very small amount of skill. Maybe, maybe you're listening to this right now and, and you got your carry permit 
and you haven't been to the range in six or seven months and you throw your your carry gun in the center console uh, or mm -hmm. in the glove compartment, you throw it on your nightstand or your nightstand drawer because you got a gun. You know, I got my gun. You come in my house. I'm going to shoot you or, you you know, get in my car. I'm armed. I'm, I'm willing to defend myself. I think people I think it's that might be a myth. Mm -hmm. They a, a, a false belief that they're going to somehow successfully fight their way out of that. And maybe not. You know, we don't we don't see a ton of failures on that level because thankfully we don't see a ton of those 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 kind of people actually having to pull a firearm out and defend themselves. But from a generic hit potential and, and skill in terms of gun handling, that might be a myth is that we're because we own a gun and because we believe in the Second Amendment, we're going to be able to pull it off mm. when the situation happens. You know, certainly, of course, I believe in the, the, the right to carry a handgun, the right to own a firearm, the right to go armed in our country, in our society. But without some semblance of proper training mm -hmm. and or the desire to practice, maybe that's the myth that yeah. we're going to be able to pull it out of our butt and skill is just going to appear from nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say most of the time people are not going to rise to the occasion, but they're going to default to whatever level of training they have. Uh, they've trained enough, right? Um, yeah. And I agree with that. I think that there is a when people think about the bump in the middle of the night or whatever the case may be, whatever scenario they run through in their head, they haven't thought through the details. I think it's the details element of it. The, okay, well, it's it's basically just, well, I have a gun. If a bad guy comes to me and threatens me in whatever way, and they probably don't even think about the three elements, you know, means, opportunity, and, and jeopardy, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot him. And then that's it. Happily ever, happily ever after. And so they haven't right. thought about uh, left of bang, right? They haven't thought about what they need to do to prepare for it. They really haven't thought about bang very much and what that, you know, uh, the grittiness of that and how that is actually going to play out in, in reality, grappling with a gun, what someone's going to do when they shoot them. Um, and then the, you know, right, mm. right of bang, the, the legal element too. It's like, there's, there's just so there's such a, it's, it's all just a myth or, or it's a oversimplification of what's actually going to happen. And I think force on force can help. With that, I think more people are becoming aware of right of bang. They're becoming aware of like the legal aspect, you know, with these insurance companies and attorneys on retainer and all that type of stuff. They're becoming aware of all these notable cases, written house, but the actual thing when it happens and the, and the, the preparing up to it, uh, maybe force on force can help with that some, like making people realize the actual mechanics and how this is not going to be as simple as you realize now it will be once you get enough training how, how would you say would be a, the best way to help people to maybe dispel those myths or start to think about the details that's a great question man I, i'm not certain i have have an answer for that i think force on force might might open their eyes to an extent um i well here, here's the problem we're faced with we, the people don't know what they don't know mm. you know the, the person that says man you know what i'm gonna I own a handgun. I've owned one for years. I bought it a long time ago. They had a special at Walmart and they were selling Glock 17s. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I'm going to go get my carry permit. You know, we, we actually did a pretty deep analysis on the numbers when I used to run the U.S. Shooting Academy here in Tulsa. Because before we, we were not a um, right to carry state then. I think Oklahoma now we were different. But we're like, well, how many people will actually follow through and it's into some semblance of next level training? And we had a really good presentation at the end of our concealed carry course to try to promote that. Mm -hmm. And it was amazingly low. Like out of mm -hmm. all of the people we ever trained, maybe one or two percent went on to the next level, mm -hmm. took another course. So I, I think people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm always amazed by that because they're like, well, they have a gun. They're going to go get their carry permit. And then they somehow think, now I'm good. I got my gun. I got my carry permit. They never actually think through any of the other things, mm -hmm. carrying the gun, where the gun is, yeah. defending the gun, defending the gun against theft, accessing the gun. Mm -hmm. What is going to cause you to decide to utilize the gun and fight with it? And I hate to say it, but a lot of people that have that mentality, and this is not lab labeling anybody, like, if, like I said, your audience they're probably highly prepared compared to most people. But the people out there that just got the gun and got the carry permit and don't decide to go any farther through their thought processes or training or research or whatever else, they're probably better off without the gun. Mm -hmm. 
Because without the gun, then they wouldn't say, well, I've got a gun. This gun will solve all problems. Mm -hmm. They would say, well, I don't have a firearm. I need to be more aware. I need to avoid that bad area. Yeah. I need to carry pepper spray. I need to make yeah. sure my doors are locked. Right. All good things. And, and the, you know, the, the gun becomes the talisman that's going to ward yeah. off evil. You know, it's, it, it's amazing to me how unskilled a lot of folks out there are. Mm -hmm. And I hope someone listen to this does get offended by mm -hmm. that. I hope they hear that and say, yeah, I've never actually taken a class. I've never actually practiced yeah. with my carry gun. Yeah. I'm not even certain I could draw effectively or holster safely. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I'm not even comfortable enough to carry with a round in the chamber. Really? Good. Get, I hope you get offended. Mm -hmm. I hope you get some training. I hope you research right. and realize, you know, think about this. And here I'll use the analogy like all of our teenagers or that are teenagers, but all of us that are parents that will have teenagers or have teenagers, do you really want them to get in the car with no knowledge or training? Would we want to get on right. the road with all those people? Right. Right. And the difference is when you get a car, you're going to drive it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. When you get a gun, you don't shoot it on a daily basis mm -hmm. at all. Matter of fact, if, if it's for self-defense, you might never, ever shoot it. Right. Uh, and the people will say, well, you know, the Second Amendment grants our rights to own a firearm and, you know, right to bear arms. Granted, it, it certainly does. You know, and I don't think it addressed training because, you know, when the, when the Second Amendment was conceived and written, well, most, you know, adult males and females were probably trained by their fathers or brothers or uncles. They probably carried some sort of firearm on a regular basis. They probably defended themselves with it. They probably hunted with mm -hmm. it. They handled it on a regular basis. They used it on a regular basis. And we were a culture of firearms. Now, not so much. Right. Now you can just go get a handgun on, you know, at a gun show and, and be like, and I got my carry permit and I'm going to throw it in my glove box. And I don't want to put one in the chamber because I'm afraid of that. And I'm going to hope for the best when things go south. That's, I don't know. Yeah. And it, it may not say anything about training, but it certainly says well-regulated. And, you know, to the people out there that think that that means government regulation, it absolutely does not mean government regulation. It does not mean National Guard. It does not mean police. It doesn't even mean state-run militia. Well-regulated means fit, prepared, and equipped for warfare. Hmm. And people are fooling themselves if they think that they are part of a well-regulated militia if they are not trained. If You can't be part of a well-regulated militia if you can't even regulate your own body weight. That's right. And now it's not a requirement, right? Like it's that's the – that first part of that article is the the, the reason why, you know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the, to the freedom of a – or to the security of a, a free state, you know, and this, this is the thing that's protected right here. This is the why. This is the thing that's protected. But – it's that rights and responsibilities. We want to focus on our rights, 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 like Alexander Solzhenitsyn said. I hear constant clamoring for rights, rights, but so very little about responsibility. And as we ignore those responsibilities, we risk losing those rights, right? It, and not, not only the, the whole you ignore the responsibility and now you're not prepared to defend yourself or prepared to um, fight tyranny or whatever, but now you're also giving the other side ammunition to metaphorically mm. to take away those rights because you are not a virtuous people anymore, right? The founding fathers also said that the, these, this documents for a virtuous people, <laughs> you know, people who are going to educate themselves, who are going to speak truthfully, right? Mm. First amendment, the first amendment doesn't require you to speak truthfully. It doesn't require you to get education. However, if you want to secure that right for the long term, then speaking truthfully and getting education will help that. You know, the, the funny thing is the, the, the anti-gun community and those that think we should not have this, this right certainly are driven in that aspect from criminal events, mm -hmm. right? All, all these horrific criminal events, which is, which, is not, which is not the kind of individual that the Second Amendment right. grants these rights toward. They're, they're violating the, the part of that principle, you know. But, but if we had a culture of folks that were really well-trained, you know, because we were not just allowed to own these these things that can certainly be lethal, but we have the responsibility to, to train and be trained in some way, shape, or form. And like I said, I'm not advocating the government mm -hmm. does that. Right. Um, that would have that would have changed a lot of things. That would have changed a lot of maybe access to some firearms that shouldn't be accessed, or individuals that utilize firearms, or even people that own firearms and had firearms that um, that would have been either secured or non-existent because they're like. Mm -hmm. a, 
guess what? This is how we work. This is how we roll. You know, if you're going to have this thing, you get this responsibility to train and, and practice, you know, much like an automobile or whatever mm-hmm. else. Um, it's a scary thing, man. It really is. You know, how do we, how do we affect change though? We could sit here and talk about it all day long. We could say, man, you know, these thousands and thousands of millions of people that got their carry permits that are out there with a firearm that are just not prepared. Well, we can, we can affect change by saying, Hey, you know, take, take your buddy to the range. Hey man, you got that carry gun. You've never, have you ever been to the range of that sucker? Come to the range with me, man, for an hour. You're a father, teach your son mm-hmm. or your daughter how to handle that firearm safely. Teach them safety rules. Yep. You're a brother, teach your brother or sister how to handle that firearm safely with a safety rule or whatever else. You know, maybe we can affect some change and then their responsibility, you know, begins when they pass that forward as well. So I have, have someone else, you know, volunteer days, helping people out. Putting free content. Interestingly enough, many years ago, we had a, uh, an active shooter situation. This was when I first started my Facebook Lives years ago. And I did two things. Number one, I sent a big email blast out and put it all on, on public and said, hey, I'm going to give away my defensive handgun training program. It was the digital version of it. You know, I wasn't going to ship actual books because, you know, that would cost me lots and lots of money which I'm not opposed to donating some of my money, but, but I gave it away. It's the full book. You just got to print it or you got to read it in PDF format. And then I started the Facebook live live streams at 6 a.m. five days a week. And initially they were all, I know, 6 a.m. I was an idiot, man. They were all defensive, you know, so it was draw process, grip, trigger sites. Since then I've taught literally hundreds of live shows on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at the, my Facebook pages or historical YouTube uploads or the free section of one of my websites, it's all in there. Like you could learn anything you want to know about firearms in that free content. And that was my donation to try to pay it forward. You know, so instead of me just going to the range and and giving lessons to one person, Mm -hmm. I was trying to get in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people and affect change, motivate them to train, give them skill and, and, and stuff like that. And maybe I, I hope it's helped. I know the people that comment on the feed say, man, this is great stuff. I appreciate this. But uh, maybe that's how we affect change is to yeah. move forward. If you're listening to this and you're you're that shooter, you love competing, you love training, maybe you're not a competitor, but you love going to the range. Hey, pay it forward. Take someone to the range. Help them out. Get them, get them into this stuff. Yeah. Get that concealed carry holder next to you trained. Absolutely. I completely agree, Mike. Well, I think that is an awesome note to end on. This has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate, again, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, Real quick, where can people find you? You know, if everybody gets on my website, they can kind of find out and branch out from there. You can go to shooting-performance.com. That's a hyphen. If you can't remember that, just mikecclanner.com will drop you to that same website as well. It'll automatically forward you. And then you can find out about the American Warrior Society and the American Warrior Show. We do have a podcast, you know, Maybe not as fantastic as yours, sir. But, no, it's uh, really, it's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, we have some good shows as well, different, a little bit different content. But uh, And, you know, I wanted to thank you for having me on, man. This is exciting. I don't get a chance to get on many podcasts these days. So when I do, it's it's really fun. It's it's interesting. Your questions were very interesting for me. to, And I probably should have read those first few, first few for a little longer and come up with some answers. That was man, great. I you were that. great. It's, it's good to have it kind of ad hoc too sometimes. That way you're, you know, think about it on the spot instead of a lot of prep. I, do, I want to be free some, yeah. man. I want to just say what comes to my brain, you know, I want to not practice. So. Well, for those of you who still can't figure out where he, he is, I'll have the links below. <laughs> so just click on those cool. hyperlinks in the, cool. in the description. But um, yeah. Mike, again, thank, thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. And as always, train to a higher standard.